on Sunday, May 29th, 2005, the morning he was about to graduate high school, Scott Moody walked across his family's failing dairy farm to his grandparents' farmhouse and shot them both dead with a 22 caliber rifle. Then he returned home, reloaded, and went from bedroom to bedroom, shooting relatives and friends while they slept. Before shooting himself twice in the head. That is the story you will find yourself reading if you look up this gruesome murder. Scott's 15-year-old sister, Stacy, miraculously survived the attack, and when she woke up, she claimed the man that shot her was not her brother, Scott. So how did Scott get framed for murdering his entire family? Let's find out. It always seems evil strikes in the places no one expects it to. Particularly this small farming community, an hour's drive outside of Columbus, Bellefontaine, Ohio, which was once a major railroad town in the 1800s. On May 29th, 2005, a young man named Scott Moody was preparing to graduate from Riverside High School in Bellefontaine. Scott lived in Bellefontaine, Ohio with his mother Sherry and his sister Stacy. However, on the day of graduation, authorities would receive an urgent 911 call and arrive at Scott Moody's home. What police were to discover was horrific. They found the bodies of Scott Moody, his mother Sherry, 14-year-old Paige Harshberger, 19-year-old Megan Karras, who were Scott's friends. Authorities would also find the bodies of Scott's maternal grandparents, Gary and Cheryl Schaefer. They lived in a separate residence on the same farm of about 100 acres of land. Someone had also shot Scott's sister, Stacy. She would be the only survivor. In only two hours, the Logan County Sheriff's Department ruled the case a murder-suicide and that Scott had killed his family before shooting himself with a 22 caliber rifle. But there was a problem. When Stacy recovered enough to speak, she was asked who shot her. She said that she was shot by a gray-haired man wearing a blue shirt. The police would dismiss her statement and tell her Scott was the shooter. Stacy said that she was face to face with the killer and it was not her brother. Also, other witnesses saw the same gray haired man around Stacy's grandparents' home before they were killed. One witness saw a gray haired man wearing a blue shirt carrying a rifle. Although Stacy and several witnesses saw this middle aged gray haired man, the Logan County Sheriff's Department has always dismissed this man as a shooter. Several people claim to know the identity of this man, and some say that he still lives in the area to this day. Let's talk about the book, written by Rob St. Clair, titled Saving Stacy. Rob represented Scott's father, and also got to know the family well. Studying court documentation, and the sheriff's documents about this case. In his book, Rob reveals several details unknown to the public of this case. Forget everything on the internet about the Scott Moody massacre, because most of it is not factual. Rob also spoke to another sheriff from a different county in Ohio, who told Rob the case was mishandled by the Logan County Sheriff's Department, and that he believed Scott was innocent. Here is Rob St. Clair speaking on the Catch My Killer podcast about the case. All rights go to Catch My Killer for this audio. 
go check out the episode on this case titled Moody Massacre. It really does shine the truth well for this case, and I recommend you go check it out. I'll leave the link in the description. Anyway, here is Rob St. Clair. The sheriff had already closed the case, basically, and said that it was a murder-suicide situation, and the only thing he was waiting on were some lab results. But he had pretty much closed the case. But now you've got Stacy telling the county coroner that's somebody else. So Stout and his partner continue to question Stacy over and over and almost badger her, finally to the point that, you know, Stacy, we can make all your problems go away if you'll just be honest with us and tell us your brother Scott was a shooter. So they basically twisted her arm to get to that point where she would finally say that, just to relent from all the pressure they were putting on her. And then as, as things go on further on and so forth, she starts again to tell the truth of what exactly happened. And when these trials came up for the wrongful death actions, we wanted to do one more thing. We wanted to hypnotize her and see if we couldn't get one more piece of evidence to prove that, in fact, what she saw was an older man with gray hair. And so that's what we did. And we found the best hypnosis in Ohio. They were former State Highway Patrol hypnotist and they ran her through the hypnosis and i thought it was so fascinating i put the whole session in there to watch how they hypnotized her and what she eventually said and obviously she came out and said it was an older man with gray hair wearing a blue shirt here's a very rare audio recording of detective stout questioning stacy moody did you see this person all i said was a gray hair gray hair i mean you couldn't say it was an older man or uh, middle-aged or younger? I'm going to all the school to try out. The problem we have with that, Stacey, is every ounce of evidence that we have is pointing us back to being Scott. So once you cross over that path, once you cross over that bridge, meaning Scott, there's no turning back. And there was no answer for him. There was no help. Whatever made him flip that morning, there was no going backwards for him. He can't take that first shot back. You've got a 15-year-old girl interviewed by two detectives, both experienced detectives, as a matter of fact, thinking that she is wrong and that they want her to finally tell the truth, that she's saying something else for whatever reason, but they want to convince her now it's time to really tell the truth to avoid anything further happening to her. A lot of intimidation put on her to make her change her story temporarily. So, she, yes, she did change her story, but then she went back to the truth. One thing, what I put in the book was the information I had. Since the, I published the book, I've probably gotten over 200 different emails, texts, and so forth with people that wanted to offer more information. And ironically, I had a couple more people offer information, information that they saw the same thing. They saw an older man with gray hair. That morning, early, one of the tenants in the farmhouses saw a car, a car pull up to the Schaefer's house, Gary and Cheryl Schaefer's house, and saw two people get out. Didn't think much of it because he thought maybe they're lost or they're looking for information or whatever. And he went back into the kitchen and was gone for several minutes. But when he came back out, he only saw one person get back into the car. And the best of his recollection is the one person that didn't get back in the car had gray hair, was an older guy probably in his what, maybe 50s or something like that, but had gray hair. And he was surprised he was only wearing a T-shirt because it was kind of chilly out that day. The second thing is one of the, one of the neighbors that has a neighboring farm that abuts to the Moody's property. Uh, that morning was getting ready to do his chores and so forth and saw a man, a gray-haired man with a blue shirt walking across the farm field. Later on, after all of that, I had somebody call me and let me know that they also saw a gray-haired man walk across the farm field that had a jacket tied around his waist and what looked like was a gun sticking out of one of the arms. They weren't sure, they didn't give it much thought until the book came out and so forth, but that's what they thought. So we had a couple of different people that saw a gray-haired man with a blue shirt walking in the, in the vicinity. Logan County Sheriff's Department is one of the most corrupt sheriff's departments in all of Ohio. And it starts with the sheriff who would let things take place whether he uh, approved of them or not, but not do anything about it. And I think he is a political person. He wanted this thing to be open and shut so the case would go away. Stacy was 15 years old. She'd suffered a traumatic experience that she didn't know what she was talking about. So she was, she was confused and unclear. And one theory along that line went that one of the uh, paramedics had their blue gowns and she might have confused a paramedic as to being the person that shot her. Another is the fact that the police are corrupt in Logan County. And 
they know exactly what happened. Two or three of the officers knew exactly what happened. They knew that Scott wasn't the shooter, and they wanted to uh, put the blame on Stacy as being confused and so forth, uh, that, it, that Scott was the shooter. They tried to make Stacy look like she was wrong. My problem is we uncovered an awful lot to believe that Scott obviously was the shooter and that it literally was set up and we believe that people involved with the Logan County Sheriff's Office were involved with the shootings. And so as a result of that, it was almost a cover-up. The last thing we want to do is, is I believe, Stacy. We want to we want to show that Stacy was, was confused, didn't know what she was talking about, that Scott was a shooter. And I remember when she said that, she sounded perfectly clear to me. She wasn't in a fog. She'd been unconscious. She's finally awake and alert, and she's able to talk. Well, Stout, Detective Stout, along with his partner, wanted to keep investigating this case and get, making sure that it, until the point where she said it was my brother and not some some older man with gray hair. But we had, we investigated scores of people. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many people we interviewed and so forth, especially in trying to uh, defend uh, the Moody estate from these two wrongful death actions. I can't recall anybody, anybody ever suspecting that Scott Moody was a shooter. Uh, people that knew him personally said there's no way. People that, that knew him from school, teachers and so forth, said they're just too hard to believe. Neighbors and people that knew of his reputation in town said this is not the type of person that would do that. And we were given different reasons why um, they thought Scott might have done this. We ran across this in different uh, court proceedings and so forth with the estate. Uh, the estate is another whole matter altogether to talk about. But the bottom line is nobody thought that Scott was a shooter. And I, because I, I'd never met him, I mean, Scott was about 5'8", 135 pounds, just a slight young fellow. I was impressed with the fact when somebody told me, you know, Scott would be the type that would stop his pickup truck on a country road to let a rabbit cross so he wouldn't kill it. He's just kind of a gentle soul, if you get what I mean. Doesn't mean he didn't have a temper, doesn't mean he didn't lose his temper every now and then and so forth. But we could never come up with a convincing motive as to why he would have been the shooter. And the, the three or four things that were thrown out, oh, he's going to become 18 and he's going to have to take over responsibility on the farm and lots of different things like that just didn't add up to um, a credible motive. There was something, I think there's just a small little paragraph in the book that talks about a counselor that Sherry Kay had seen several months before the shooting. And Sherry Kay had told this counselor how violent the kids were and how worried she was about Scott and his temper and everything else. And I felt that you had to put it, I had to put it in the book because this was one of the reports. Well, it wasn't until after the book was published where this counselor contacted me and said, I never spoke with Sherry Kay. That's a bogus report. There's no truth to it whatsoever. And I'm going, what in the world was that all about? Because we had gotten her freedom of information request. We'd gotten every single report that the sheriff's office had on this case. And one of the reports that we had was written saying that this counselor said this. So I sent that report to the lady and asked her if this was her report that she uh, agreed on. She said, absolutely not. Didn't sign it. Wasn't her signature. Had nothing to do with it. So kind of interesting as a side note. Those are the type of things that came up after the book was published. We think it was set up. It was one more piece of evidence to show that Scott had a motive, that Scott could have been the shooter. And here, here's more proof. Here's a therapist report that nobody would ever question. I didn't question it. I'm looking at the actual copy of the report, and I read it, and I go, well, I guess this is something that a therapist has said until I get this text message from the actual therapist that said that wasn't me. You know, I, I never met with the Sherry K. Schaefer. I never signed anything like that. It didn't happen. And so I'm going, I don't know. What, I know I know what I think, but I think I think it was a setup. Somebody made it up to be substantiate the, um, the shooting, one more piece of evidence. No, I, listen, there are so many different red flags. Let me just give you one example. You're dealing with an 18 year old kid who doesn't like firearms. He doesn't go out, want to go out and shoot rabbits or anything else. Everyone that was shot was basically shot behind the ear in what's called a double tap. And a double tap, known to most criminals, is they kill a person, if you're going to kill them, shoot them behind the ear, not only once, but twice to make sure that it's effective and it's done. Well, if you look at every one of these people that was shot, every person that was shot, they were shot behind the ear. No 18-year-old kid like Scott Moody is going to understand that concept, let alone do it, carry it out the way it was carried out. So that's one huge red flag in the sense of how these killings were, were carried out. The second, of course, is the way Scott's body was found. And this disturbed me a lot. 
the first time he was shot, it was obvious that he was up at the by the headboard of his bed, and there's blood spatter on the on the wall behind him and so forth. And apparently, that's where he then took this 22 rifle and held it behind his ear, a good couple of inches away from his skin because there's no residue on his skin, and, and shot himself the first time. But apparently, that didn't do the trick. And then you see where these blood streaks, railroad tracks on the bed where he's dragged down to the bottom of his bed and his feet are planted on the floor. And this is where he shoots himself a second time in the mouth. And just looking at that, you're going, there's nowhere in the world after he had been shot the first time was he capable of doing this and repositioning his body to such an extent that he shoots himself a second time. And then to go further than that, the way the gun, the rifle was placed, Anytime you think, just I think this is just common sense. Anytime you're going to fire a weapon, if you're committing suicide, the gun's pretty much going to fly out of your hands. It might be, it might be close to you, but it ain't going to be right next to you. Rifle looked like it had been placed right next to his body with his thumb and the, and the trigger guard. And even the way his thumb was placed, it wasn't placed the way you would pull the trigger. It was the opposite direction. So you look and you go, how in the world can you ever think that this person committed suicide and shot himself twice? and ended up like this. And then we have other discrepancies throughout all of that, especially with the, um, the evidence that the lack of evidence that was taken that was skipped over by the sheriff's department. The blood spatter, for example, on the wall in Scott's bedroom was never tested to confirm that it was his. Uh, the amount of shells, the shells casings where they were, there's just lots of different things like that that were, that were prob- problematic uh, in the investigation. Uh, other people pointed that out too. What in the world is this guy doing wearing clean white socks? And the belt is another issue type thing because of, because of how, uh, how thin he was. I, you know, that's where I think I hopefully highlighted in the book. You can just come up with scores of different, uh, red flags like that saying, how in the world can you pin this on Scott as being the shooter? Uh, 100% I'm convinced that he was not the shooter. When we finished, and if you think about it, we spent hundreds of hours on this case, uh, both myself and uh, one of my colleagues, not only preparing for for trials and so forth, but the different witnesses that we had to talk to and the depositions that were conducted and everything else and the evidence that we looked at. Ron Murray is a good example because I think that came up. Ron Murray was the chief of police in another, another city there, another town close by to Bell Fountain. But when we reviewed this entire case with them, we just came up with countless red flags and said, this just doesn't make sense. How in the world could this have happened? So the answer to your question in a nutshell, I am 100% convinced that Scott was not the shooter, that he was set up, that somebody else did it. In fact, we felt pretty comfortable when the case was all over that we knew who the shooter was. Just a matter of what we're going to do with that information. That was Rob St. Clair. I had to include those clips of him talking about it because he brings up so many valid points to as why Scott was not the killer and was framed for killing his family. Leave a comment of what you think really happened. It's definitely a sad and heartbreaking story. Now for the second part of this episode. I had to Bellefontaine, Ohio to where Scott's house once stood and the cemetery he and his family are buried at. Scott's home apparently burned down a few years ago, and there is now a weird storage facility where it stood. The whole thing is super fishy if you ask me. It seems like the town covered up anything and everything they could that had to do with this case. But that hasn't stopped me before. Let's go check it out. Residents of a Northwest Ohio community tonight are coming to grips with what's being called the worst tragedy ever in their town. Six people, two of them children, were found shot to death in Western Ohio today. Another child survived with a shot in the neck. The victims were in two houses on a farm northwest of Columbus. Police believe the shooter is among the victims. Logan County Sheriff's Department says their early assessment is that this was a murder-suicide, and tonight they and the rest of the community are still looking for answers. The lone survivor, a 15-year-old female, is in critical condition at Ohio State University Medical Center in Columbus. It's really a tragedy. I just can't explain it.
Alright guys, what is up? It is like 12 a.m. right now. I'm here at Greenwood Cemetery in Bellefontaine, Ohio, and I have finally discovered Scott Moody's grave and his mother, Sherry K. Schaefer, I think. That may have been wrong, but uh, yeah, I found the grave. It was super hard to find. I think there's only one photo on, of this place online, which is absolutely crazy. If you think about what happened, and then think there's just one photo of the grave, it's just insane. Actually, we got uh, caught at the facility. Someone in a truck actually came up and told us that we couldn't be there and if he sees us there again, he's gonna call the police. So I guess it could have been worse. He just gave us a warning, which was cool, but uh, it still sucks because I wanted to investigate that property. We found the grave and this should be just as equally as cool, so we're gonna do a spirit box session and see if there's anything here with us and see if Scott has anything to say about the murders. You can see the K2 meter set directly on top of where it says Sherry K. Schaefer Moody. So you can keep a watch on that. Is there anybody here with me as I ask questions near this grave? Yeah guys, this has to be one of the saddest stories I've ever heard of like a murder mystery because literally the scariest thing about this is that the killer is still out there to this day just living in this area apparently which is freaking insane you don't hear that anymore it's 2022 that doesn't really happen anymore so it's just really scary that the killer is even still out there i mean that's like unheard of nowadays Was your house burned down and was your house burned down intentionally? Do you want me to leave the cemetery or do you want me to stay and ask you more questions? Yeah. Damn, that was a clear yeah. Who wants me to leave? So in section, it says section O online, but if you look in section O, you will not find the grave. It's like on the border of the cemetery, basically. I guess the way, best way to describe it. It's close to section O, but it's not. All right, guys, I am standing directly in front of Scott Moody's grave, and I got the PSP7 spirit box here. I'm gonna ask a few questions and see if Scott or his mother would like to say anything about what happened or would like to state their case, but let's go ahead and see. Is there anybody here with me at the Greenwood Cemetery that would like to speak? Hey guys, this is such a beautiful cemetery during the day. I'm happy I came back because I did not get to see all this beautiful scenery when I came at night. But uh, yeah, this is gorgeous. I'm glad I made the trip back. Was Scott Moody wrongly accused of killing his family? Scott, were you wrongly accused? <laughs> Scott, are you innocent? Is there anything you would like to say? Are, are you upset about what happened to you?
It's getting pretty windy. I need a crew. Is Scott Moody here with me? Did someone else kill Scott? Who killed the Moody family? What is his name? Terry K, would you like to say anything? Yep. You can use this spirit box to communicate or say something to me. Um. Have either of you ever seen the man that actually committed the crime before this happened? Are you guys upset about what happened and how it played out after you guys left? I'll just change the camera view a little bit so you guys can see the graves. But yeah, this is a beautiful headstone as well. Um, you know, it's also odd to note that if Scott killed his mom and his family, why would they bury Scott with his mother and essentially make it look like, you know, he was a good kid or whatever, you know? It just looked like a normal grave. But, you know, it just seems like a lot of times, like, when someone murders somebody, like a murderer, when they die, they have, like, an unmarked grave or, like, their grave is demolished or something so it really is just a great clue just looking at this grave and knowing that it's not like destroyed and there's flowers on it and there's angels that just tells you that the people in the community must know that this man or this kid was innocent and uh, it's just a real shame it's just a real shame that there hasn't been anything done about it and uh, it's just it's really disgusting it really is I feel so bad for the Moody family and everybody that went through that whole experience. It's uh, one of the most traumatic stories I've ever heard about in the state of Ohio. We're going to ask a few more questions on the spirit box and see you know, if they want to answer, but I'm never going to add anything in to make it more scary or anything. Everything you see is what really happened and what I really picked up on my camera and uh, what I hear and stuff, so I'm not going to add in anything for shock value. This is what it is. Um, it's a really scary story. Unfortunately, we couldn't go to the house, but uh, the cemetery is really, really cool. This is a beautiful place, and uh, nobody's really gone to this grave, so... Would either of you like to say anything to me? Would, would either of you like to say anything while I'm here? You can speak to me through the spirit box, this device I'm holding. Scott, would you like to say anything?
Scott, are you upset about what happened to you? How old were you when you died? Every day. Eight. I heard an eight. That's really creepy because Scott was 18. Were you 18 when you passed away? Were you 18 when you passed away? Who committed this murder? Who killed you guys? Who actually committed the crime? Earn the right. Something came through, but I... Earn or Ernie? I don't know. Could've been... Is it true that Scott did not murder his family? came across a grave that they uh, saved actually. They put a piece of wood in the back of it so it wouldn't tip over and there's like these steel beams holding it on each side. That's really cool, I've never seen that actually. And I've been to a lot of cemeteries. That's awesome. These graves are always so cool to me. It literally looks like a blanket laying over the top of the gravestone. Doesn't it? It looks so real. A really unique gravestone here. This looks just like a tree. From a distance, you wouldn't even be able to tell that it was a gravestone. That's so cool. I've never seen something like that. If you guys love cemeteries and you're ever near the Columbus area in Ohio, definitely stop in Bellefontaine and check out the cemetery. This is seriously one of the most beautiful cemeteries I've seen. So that's going to wrap it up for today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. Um, this one really hit home because I really think Scott Moody should have the justice he deserves. Um, it's just really sad what happened and how his name is being put through the dirt. But if you enjoyed, leave a like, leave a comment of what you thought and what you think about this entire situation, and uh, subscribe to The Urban Files if you haven't yet. I'm going to be posting weekly uploads, and also, if you're on TikTok, go follow my TikTok. It's at The Urban Files. I'm going to start be I'm gonna be posting content on there every week, and I'm going to be posting the videos I'm filming, so it's going to be kind of like a behind-the-scenes experience for the people watching and my subscribers. But yeah, go check out my TikTok uh, weekly uploads on there. And again, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Stay spooky. I'll catch you all next week.